Uh, my name is Cynthia Brothers. I'm the founder of Vanishing Seattle, which is a social media project that documents the displaced and disappearing um, local institutions, small businesses, communities, and cultures of this city, um, and also celebrates the places that um, give this city its soul. Um, and it's just been, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the show box is on everyone's mind tonight. It's been a whirlwind week. It's been a crazy day. Um, Eugenia from Historic Seattle will share a bit more about that. Um, but you probably heard that um, we submitted a nomination for landmark status um, for the show box just yesterday. Um, yeah, so some exciting stuff going on. Um, and uh, I was just asked to, you know, share some of what I've seen from my vantage point. Um, running Vanishing Seattle. Um, and before I get into it, um, I do want to acknowledge that we are on stolen Coast Salish land. Um, so this is nothing new. We've been displacing people and dispossessing people of their culture since the 1850s. Um, so, you know, not to equate or minimize that, but I think what we've, you know, been experiencing is very much, you know, a legacy of that, and I think there's some parallels in the processes and the narrative that's used to continue to displace people. Um, so I uh, try to keep that context in mind. Um, and yeah, the name of tonight's event is A Sense of Place, and from what I've seen, um, more and more people in this city sense that there isn't a place for them here anymore as they keep losing the spaces that they're connected to. And the show box, uh, in a lot of ways, to a lot of folks, felt like the last straw. And it also feels like it's been a very long journey to get to the show box in that there's already been so many important and beloved places that have been demolished or displaced already. Um, so right now, just shout out a place that mattered to you that's already gone. Music hall. Two bells, romper room, teeny bigs, upstairs. All right, <laughs> we don't got all night, but <laughs> um, yeah. So I would love to share with you a place that mattered to me, and this was actually my very first post on Vanishing Seattle. Um, it was of a Filipino restaurant on Beacon Hill called Inai's, and Inai's had a server and a drag performer. Her name is Natasha Manila. And every Friday, she would do this incredible, like three hour long, one woman drag show. And, um, you know, because of Inai's location, North Beacon Hill, rapidly gentrifying, the rent got raised, and so Inai's had to close. Uh, to me, that was just such a powerful, defiant moment in this special place that felt uniquely Seattle. Um, you had a cross-section of the Filipinx and the queer and the Beacon Hill community. And I just had this urge to document that and share that as a way to show people, look, this is what we're losing when these places get pushed out. And these are the type of places that really matter. And I wanted to highlight Inai's because culture doesn't always happen in you know, art museums or Seattle Art Fair or you know, these uh, sanctioned places where we have permission to be creative and to consume art. Um, they happen uh, at places like Inai's and in dive bars and in punk houses, at the Promenade Red Apple, um, at places like Black and Tan Hall, um, who we're here from tonight. Um, and Seattle has this tradition of um, these diverse, like, grassroots cultural spaces that, you know, the show box is part of that, you know, these places feed into the show box and, you know, all of these places are legit and also um, need, to, need to be protected. Um, and I think it's difficult, uh, if not impossible, to just, you know, demolish and replicate these places. I mean, especially for the show box, I mean, the magic that happens there really goes hand in hand with its physical layout, its intimacy, its history, there's a reason why musicians from all over the world um, love to, to play there. And it kind of reminds me of back in the 60s when the city and property owners tried to bring urban renewal to Pike Place Market. And they wanted to um, demo the historic buildings there for skyscrapers and then have this new smaller replacement be the market. And people recognized back then that this was not a solution. 
Um, and it was only through community opposition and organizing that we still have the market today. And you know, as we, it's, as we know, it's one of the most visited attractions in the world. Um, and I often hear this narrative that losing these places is just um, a part of progress, or that they're even standing in the way of progress. Um, but I encourage us to keep asking, who is all this progress for? And who is it shutting out? And what is a world-class city without artists and musicians and the spaces that support them? And I think the Showbox is a huge opportunity for Seattle beyond the fight for the actual venue. It's exposing the limitations of the landmarking protections, how it can often be gamed by developers to their benefit. Um, it's showing the need for the city to hold developers accountable. And it's an opportunity for meaningful policy and systemic change. So hopefully we don't have to keep having these soul-wrenching site fights over and over and over again. Um, in the meantime, please do keep fighting for the places that you love. And we've got to be proactive about it. Um, you know, one thing we can do is look into the places that we care about. I mean, a lot of places are vulnerable and they're not landmark yet, like the crocodile is one example. Um, and chances are that people with money and power don't care about these places like we care about these places. Um, and you can talk to the Historic Seattle, learn more about um, the landmark nomination process, um, so community can get to these places before someone else does. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, what we're really fighting for is our shared culture. And that is something that is so powerful. And that culture is what we're going to draw upon to win. And I really believe that we are going to win this. Um, so please, yes, what are we going to do? <laughs> um, yeah, so I encourage y'all to please you know, get in touch with me. Um, feel free to send me questions, pictures, tips. Um, I also want to you know, say really quick, give some shout outs. Um, there's a lot of you know, other great people that are doing incredible work around cultural preservation and anti-displacement. Just to name a few um, groups and artists, uh, there's Artist Coalition for Equitable Development and Julie C. Uh, Got Green, Chinatown International District, Humbaus Not Hotels, Friends of Historic Belltown, Historic Central Area Arts and Cultural District, Ghosts of Seattle Pass, Shelf Life Stories, John Cusatello. Those are just a few, and you know, please check them out, support them. Uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Again, I'm Michael Syrath. I'm with Capitol Hill Housing. And I want to talk about how we can uh, be proactive. I think a lot of us are here tonight in reaction to some really bad news about the show box. And once a multinational corporation has its hands on a building, it's often too late to do something about it. I don't know if that's the case in this, with this building, and I, I really hope it's not. But what can we do long term to preserve the soul of our neighborhoods, to keep the things that we value most? And yeah, I'm going to talk a lot about Capitol Hill. Uh, this is a neighborhood that's uh, long had a lot of arts and cultural districts in it and buildings like this, kind of old warehouse buildings that were renting for cheap in the 90s. And a lot of them ended up in the Oddfellows building, which is right here. And there's a slightly dated photo of it. And there were almost 40 nonprofits in that building. And the building sold and every single nonprofit was kicked out of the building. And we got together as a neighborhood and then as a city and said, we have to stop this. What can we do and be more proactive to make sure that uh, communities can respond to issues like this and present it, prevent it from happening again? Um, one thing that came out of it was this idea of working together in partnership. Um, Seattle's really, really expensive and it's an expensive place to build. So I work at Capitol Hill Housing. We develop affordable apartments. And we came up with this idea of working with arts groups. And we took a surface parking lot two blocks from here at 12th Avenue Arts that the police parked in, put that underground, have two performing arts spaces, and then affordable housing on top. And it's a project that filled up on day one, and there hasn't really been a vacancy since then. So none of this is, is enough. And we need, to, we need to have more uh, partnerships, more structures, and more policies in place to make it. Um, we pushed a, for a position at the city of Seattle that focuses full-time on arts and culture preservation. 
uh, Matt Richter, who you're going to hear from in a minute, um, was uh, hired for that. And I almost can't imagine Seattle now without someone at the city that you could just call and say, this building is up for sale, or how do we solve this? And there kind of be no one at the city that has trouble to, to even time to deal with it. So we haven't gotten a ton of wins on buildings, um, but we've gotten a lot of uh, policy wins and some new funding, and we've uh, been able to save some spaces. Um, one thing that came out of it was, was organizing and working more at the neighborhood level. So this idea of an arts district, um, Capitol Hill, had all these arts organizations here, not because of some top-down government policy in 1985 that said there shall be 20 arts organizations on Capitol Hill. It happened because of a lot of scrappy individuals and organizations that came together, started spaces, or coordinated, or were drunk and not paying attention and did it anyway. Um, and, and over time, we got this space, so this idea of we could um, come together to preserve what we have and be proactive on, on keeping more. So this is the first arts district in the city and there's one in Uptown and the CD and the fourth one's gonna be announced uh, in about eight days. Um, so how do we pivot from one win like 12th Avenue Arts and then this idea of coming together towards actual change actual uh, wins where we're keeping more buildings, these older buildings in the neighborhood. So one thing we're working on is the Capitol Hill Arch Stabilization Fund. And it's borrowing from a lot of models around the country where we can be proactive. We raise money and then we go buy buildings. Um, Vivian was talking about that for a second. Um, there's a really great inspiration in the Bay Area called the Cultural Arch Stabilization Fund or CAST, run by Moyang, who's a genius at raising tens of millions of dollars in the most expensive real estate market in the country, essentially, and then working with arts groups to buy buildings. So we want to pilot it here on Capitol Hill and then figure out how we can scale it. Maybe we'll scale it, maybe someone else will, but we're, we're, we're not going to wait. So we're kicking off right now a million dollar fund that we're raising so that we can go to uh, property owners and say, we share your values. We want to keep these art spaces in the neighborhood and uh, consider selling to someone like us. We'll either bridge it to a nonprofit or we're a public development authority and we're the neighborhood community building organization. We've been around for 42 years and we're not going anywhere. So that kind of long-term stable ownership. And those conversations often, often happen over years not months, weeks, days, or hours. So it's something that as we're raising funds, we're able to have more entree and more uh, conversations about preserving space. Um, we brought some flyers, there's some in the lobby, I'll hand them out in a minute, but uh, there's more ways to get involved. The easiest stuff is you can follow the Arts District on Facebook. Um, you can push the city to support more funding for arts and culture, push the county, particularly right now. Um, and other ways to get involved. So uh, let's hope this becomes a model for how we can, over time, keep more of these spaces. Thank you. We are here tonight to talk about a sense of place. To me, this means a place that is infused with energy and spirit. As we watch our city rapidly transform into sterile retail spaces in luxury apartments, the cultural sector is tasked with protecting the leftover scraps and struggling to maintain a sense of place that includes history and spirit. I live and breathe music. I moved to Seattle in 2001 because of its legendary music scene. I wanted to live in a place that valued music, where music was woven into the very fabric of its culture. I wanted to be an active part of this music scene. I'm not a musician. I came to listen and to meet others who love music as fiercely as I do. I have now worked at the Showbox for 17 years, and I feel sick that the city could lose this music, beautiful music venue. Have you ever witnessed 1,000 people singing every word of their favorite song together? Anyway, it's an incredible power to behold. Yay! Okay. Live music performances are joyful and often transformative. I watch the crowd more than the performers. The energy exchange between, former, between performer and audience is electric. I get chills and sometimes I cry. The show box is irreplaceable. It has lived-in energy. 
Hundreds of thousands of feet have danced on our wooden floor. Hundreds of thousands of voices have sung and screamed to the top of the ballroom ceiling. It's a place where people gather to celebrate and to connect, both physically and emotionally. And when this magical place is gone, it can't be recreated. We're not fighting to save a name or a memory. We're fighting to save a place that is both significant to Seattle's cultural history and actively contributes to this culture today. A place that provides jobs for hundreds of artists, musicians, and working class people. A place of catharsis and connection in a fragmented world. Music is our universal language and connector, but we need places in which to gather and listen. Music builds community. I came to this venue for the music, but in the end, I stayed for the people. Some will make affordable housing arguments against saving the showbox. In fact, few who work at the showbox can afford what the city defines as affordable housing. So let's be clear. If the showbox is demolished, it will wipe out hundreds of jobs. Jobs for musicians, stagehands, production managers, audio and lighting engineers, bartenders, barbacks, servers, box office, coat check, merch, and security. On any given night, the showbox employs roughly 30 to 45 people. Many of our venue employees are struggling artists and musicians themselves. Most work multiple jobs to make ends meet. We should not trade a 79-year-old iconic music venue that books hundreds of shows per year and provides jobs for the creative community for a few units of affordable housing. This will create more instability for those the city claims they are trying to help. In 2007, our city's Office of Film and Music created a vision statement and development plan for the city to become, for Seattle to become a city of music by 2020. I'd like to share that vision statement with you. We value music as a dynamic force that enriches the lives of residents, visitors, and listeners around the globe. Seattle will be acknowledged as a distinctive center for music, where a spirit of innovation continually renews a thriving music industry, both economically and culturally. The talent of our individual musicians of all ages and musical genres and the engagement of audiences will be the foundation of the city's vibrant culture. Audiences, business leaders, educationers, or, sorry, educators, and politicians will enthusiastically support the creative, economic, and community value of music. <laughs> I love this vision. It's the city I dreamed of before I moved here. But if our policies do not support this vision, the words are meaningless. If our laws allow developers to destroy the cultural places we love in the city, then we must change the laws. Civic pride should not be dismissed as nostalgia. Ursula Le Guin wrote, any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often begin in art. So thank you for listening and for speaking up for the places you love. So we're going to start with Ben, who's conveniently sitting right next to me. Um, ben Hunter is a violinist, storyteller, educator, and community enterpriser who has co-founded a number of organizations, including Community Arts Create, which uses arts as a vehicle for community development and engagement as well as two co-op spaces that are dedicated to inclusivity, including Hillman City C Collaboratory and Black and Tan Hall. So I want to kind of start about talking about Black and Tan Hall. And we're talking about the, like how development kind of has been blindsiding us a lot. And a lot of that is because of kind of how opaque it is. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the, firstly, the vision of Black and Tan Hall, which is amazing, and then kind of some of the challenges you've run into with opening it up. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, uh, I, before I get into that, which I, I think it's important to mention that one of the fundamental, um, 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 one of the beginning parts for any of these enterprises is recognizing our history in the city, um, recognizing our, our city in our history in, in regards to redlining, in, reg in regards to have and have nots. Um, I love the show box, but I couldn't help but notice that the photos that were being presented were largely of white folks, 
And if we think about the history of Seattle, Jackson was the color line for performers. Um, it wasn't unless, do you need me to talk louder? Is that better? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not used to microphones. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I, <laughs> I should be used to microphones. I'm a musician. Anyways, um, <laughs> but, uh, but we, have to, we have to understand that history. Um, we can talk about, you know, saving these venues, and we can talk about um, how all of a sudden we're, we, we find ourselves blindsided by um, this wave of gentrification or this wave of, like, vapid uh, technological, like, screen whatever that's, that's preventing people from seeing culture or, or music or dance or whatever. Um, but this has been happening to specific folks in the city for a really long time, not having access to um, things that help um, shape our values and our culture and what the city is supposed to be made of. And instead, um, folks have, um, brown, and brown and black folks have had to create their own culture, their own culture inside of a culture that doesn't want to represent them. And so it's, it's with that that um, Community Arts Create was developed. It's with that that the Hillman City Collaboratory was developed. And it was very much with that in mind that the Black and Tan Hall was developed. Black and tans around the country um, existed in black parts of town, usually black owned, black ownership, um, that were jazz clubs um, that uh, challenged segregation and wanted to be integrated because they recognized the value in people coming together to listen to jazz music, to be in one place, to dance, to imbibe, to sing, to play music. Um, and so in that sense, it was fundamentally accessible and it was fundamentally um, uh, uh, rooted in uh, a value system that uh, extended beyond commerce and capitalism, but rooted very much in togetherness and place. And so, um, you know, in creating the Black and Tan Hall, that was very much a part of what we wanted to do. We wanted to be explicitly accessible, um, but also be explicit in in our challenge to systems that don't that historically don't support um, or represent the disenfranchised. And so that's why we're community owned, that's why we're cooperative, is because we want it to be um, voiced by people in the community, run by people in the community, um, instead, of, instead of people with money, instead of people with resources that, that control things from, from the dollar and not from the heart. Um, and so uh, we've run into a series of problems, and I, I attribute those problems to, again, a history that is, is, isn't, isn't for common folk. It's for people with money that have means to buy whatever they need to buy to open up a building. It's absurd that we've had to spend two and a half years paying rent on a building that we can't open because of occupancy issues, because of water valve issues, because of whatever issues that aren't even our problem, right? They're not even our problem to deal with a, a water main system outside of our walls underground in a on rain, in rainier avenue. Right? That shouldn't be our responsibility to open up a business. And then instead we spent a couple hundred thousand dollars just waiting on permits and all the other things because Seattle is growing so fast and so quick and so blindly so as not to recognize what it means to be a, a small business owner and what small business ownership means to the, to the, to the heart of a city. Um, so uh, that was a passionate That was outburst. great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kicking it off strong. <laughs> so that is a good segue into um, some question, an additional question for you and also for Matthew Richter. Matthew Richter is the cultural space liaison at the Office of Arts and Culture. He has he works with stabilizing and increasing the number of square, cultural square footage in the city. Um, so in 2017, the Office of Art, Arts and Culture published the CAP report, which if y'all haven't read it, you should. It's 30 ideas to create and preserve space within the city. So a couple things I wanted to touch on that, oh, there we go. <laughs> a couple things I wanted to touch upon in the CAP report um, are the Build Art Space Equitably or Base Certification Cohort, of which Ben is a part. I believe, and um, a new position that was created within the S Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections. So if you two could comment on those and how those two things can help um, give power to marginalized voices at least a bit and also help serve, um, save cultural space in the long run. Um, yeah, hello, hello. I think it was right there. 
Hi. Vivian, you used the word opaque in referencing the development process and how it really tends to be sort of the, the black box of stereo equipment that you know makes music somehow, but you're not exactly sure what goes on inside of it. The development process in town tends to be the that opaque of a process, especially for the cultural community. It's one of those things that we know we have to get involved with. We know that, that the Northwest Film Forum is reliant on an understanding and a participation in, an understanding of and a participation in the real estate world of Seattle. But what those processes are, what those timelines are, how that money moves, how do you interact with it is something that we, um, as a community, as a sector, tend to not understand. And the interesting thing that I found from the position of cultural space liaison at the city is that the development world, the commercial property development world, also sees the cultural world as something that they desperately want to be involved with, desperately might be stating it too, too strongly, are interested in being involved with, but similarly don't understand um, what these organizations are and how they function and what those relationships might look like. So Build Art Space Equitably was an attempt to knit those two worlds together and to answer some of those questions. We created a cohort that is 30 some odd people. Eugenia is a member of it as well. It's about equally split between members of the cultural community and folks from the commercial development community. It's an entirely POC, people of color based cohort. It is a year long process where we will certify the cohort as cultural space, um, cultural space experts essentially at the end of the year. We're looking to build a community that understands that process, that black box from both sides. Um, and so it's a, it's a series of cohort learning sessions. It's a series of uh, expert teachings around capital stacks and, and, and uh, pipelines around cultural development and commercial development, um, and also about cultural capital and community capital and how the, what, what is that alchemy that translates community capital into financial capital um, and vice versa. So that's basically where that is coming from. Ben is a member of it, Eugenia is a member of it, um, and we're in the launch year right now. The other project- SDCI. Sorry? Yeah, the SDCI position. So again, one of the, that was a recommendation from Cap Report. Another recommendation from Cap Report was um, create a position at the permitting and inspections, the construction department basically, someone who's gonna wear a hat that says arts. And so any cultural project that's coming through the system has someone to go through who can translate, who speaks both languages around uh, code enforcement, commercial development, and also arts and culture. So we funded a half-time position. It's someone who's currently already a permit lead in the department. Um, half of their time is spent on the normal shoe stores and gymnasiums and things that we permit, apartment buildings. And half of that time is spent shepherding arts and cultural projects through the same system. Large developers are enormously well resourced when it comes to navigating that system and it's an incredibly difficult system to navigate as anybody who's had to go in for a permit to put a deck on the back of their house knows. It's not a system that is built for the average homeowner who's going to go through one capital project in their life or the average nonprofit that's going to go through one large capital project in their life. It's a system that's built for experts and for folks who can then hire up additional experts to help them navigate it. The creation of this SDCI liaison was to try and bring some equity to that world, to try and bring some resources to the folks who can't necessarily bring Jack McCullough to the table, who can't necessarily bring um, some of these permit specialists and, and legal experts to the table to help them navigate that system. Um, creating some resources from the city embedded in the city uh, to equalize that process for folks. Thank you. Um, Eugenia or Ben, do you, either of you want to comment on base and your participation in it at all? Um, sure. Uh, one question is um, the half time. That, that, I think it's great that SDCI has this position. Is this um, someone that anyone can reach out directly to, or yeah. you sort of, what is this person's name, or do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the role is called the Arts Permit Liaison. Um, the person's name is Jeff McHegg. You can reach out to me and I can connect to you. You can also reach out directly. Uh, this person is uh, currently employed half time by SDCI and half time by Arts, so they report directly to Arts for that time that they spend still sitting in the permits department um, working on cultural space projects. Oh, great. That's, I think it's really important to learn how to navigate the city processes and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been um, a cohort in base uh, since it started and I'm really happy to be part of it. I think it's really important what the, what the Office of Arts and Culture is doing and their leadership in this. 
um, it's an experiment. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we'll we'll see how uh, where it goes. But I think it's really important to 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 do that so we can all learn from each other and and um, you know l learning is power and understanding um, um, how you know how to work within the system and also how to try to improve it and make it better for everyone is really important. Um, I, I, I am also um, thrilled to be a part of the, the, the cohort. It's really interesting to talk about these topics with, some, with people that share the same, um, the same enthusiasm for finding a fix to this. I think one of the things that I'm looking forward to doing, and you know, Matt used the word alchemy, I, I'm looking forward to um, shifting how we all approach development in the city and creating some sort of magic around um, uh, making it less complicated, making it something that people can understand um, generally, so that it doesn't have to be some sort of uh, you know secret code to to operate in the city. Um, but uh, I'm on tour right now, so it's hard for me to do this next thing. But uh, Julie C and I have talked about it a lot. Is is taking you know being we're here to represent artists in the city, and uh, we can't do that. Uh, to the capacity we want to and, and until we get people's input. And um, so, you know, one of the things that her and I are looking forward to doing when we both find some more time is, is being a conduit currently um, for base to the people and making sure that we get everybody else's concerns around these issues too and some of the things that you guys don't understand that maybe we're not thinking about. Um, because we need to turn this on its side. And I know I'm like this like, like loud person right now, but like we, we need to figure out how to, we need to figure out how to make this this system work for people that it has not been trained and built to work for, and that's what I'm excited about for this cohort is to is to is to be with people that that have the ability to turn this on its side and make it into something that we can actually uh, push forward. Let me say one last thing about the cohort, and I'm sorry I didn't mean to stop on your applause. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say that we'll be uh, forming the second cohort because this is for sure a project that's going to live beyond this first group um, over the course of the spring and summer of next year. It was really important to us to base this first cohort entirely in communities of color, um, entirely with the communities who have borne the brunt of a lot of the institutionalized racism that, as Ben was saying, has created this disproportionate divide in the control and access to cultural space. Over the course of the coming years, that is going to spread from that community out into the broader community. And so if anyone here, clearly this is of interest to you, if anyone here is interested in joining that cohort further down the road, please reach out to our office and we'll keep you uh, on the radar for that. Thank you. Okay, so Eugenia, I have a question for you. Um, and Eugenia is the Historic Seattle's Director of Preservation Services. Um, can you tell us a bit about kind of bringing the ex landmark designation application and turning it in before the developers did and what that kind of, what the service of that is and also what the limitations of a landmark solution are. Sure, so as we segue into city process, <laughs> uh, you can't get more processy than the landmarks nomination process. Um, I just made up a new word. But um, so yeah, so Historic Seattle, we've been around since, since 1974. And we own eight landmarks in the city or properties in historic districts. So, um, from an, so we're real estate developers. We're also uh, educators. We have uh, annual programs, and we're also we are advocates. So, with the show box, um, this definitely uh, falls into the advocacy side of things. Um, pretty much, like some people in this room, um, since July 25th, when we heard about. Uh, the threat to the show box, we sort of just um, jumped into action. And this has probably been the biggest effort, definitely in my nine years in, at Historic Seattle and potentially in the whole history of our organization, how deeply we've been into this um, advocacy effort. And so one of the things that we knew was that we knew, the la um, according to the local media, that the um, developer was going to submit a landmark nomination, not because they want to actually get it landmarked, but in the city, you could, it's a planning tool. Anyone anyone can nominate can submit a nomination, so owner consent is not required. Um, and so their nomination is something what we call an anti-nomination or a negative nomination, where the purpose is to submit a nomination report for the purpose of. Uh, convincing the Landmarks Preservation Board, which makes the decisions, 
to not nominate or designate as a two-step process. So on our side, from a strategic standpoint, we were discussing, well, we can't possibly get a nomination done in that, that fast before the developer, because they hire a consultant, and they were going to get it done in four to six weeks. And we just thought, well, OK, we'll, we'll do what we usually do, and we'll be the advocates, and we'll go to the landmarks board, and we'll do calls to action, and we'll get people to attend the public meetings and public hearings. And you know, you get your one minute to talk, and, which isn't a lot of time. And um, so, we, so the question came, well, can we do our own nomination? And so we decided to take the chance, and we did. Uh, we hired a, a historic preservation consulting firm that specializes in these things, uh, Northwest Vernacular. And we caught them at a really good time. They were between projects. And so they basically were able to uh, take this on. Um, and they researched and wrote a landmark nomination report in 10 days. This is, <laughs> I don't <know>. I, <laughs> 10 days. <laughs> Most people can't get much done in 10 days, but these guys, they, um, it was, I've, I've done this a lot myself. I've done a lot of nominations. It usually takes several weeks, could take months. Um, and they did it in 10 days. And so uh, it was submitted yesterday, submitted to the Landmarks Board, and it's going to get reviewed, and hopefully it'll be deemed complete. Uh, the idea was to be the first one in, it was to beat the developer um, because once they submitted it, then we could not submit our own nomination. Uh, the city doesn't generally take two competing nominations. Um, they'll still be able to submit theirs because they are the developer and they have the owner's permission to do this. And so, um, so hopefully we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be up there. Basically, that gives us more time, so we we can then be the applicant and present to the Blamars board and have 30 minutes or 45 minutes as opposed to. A minute, and um, so so that was why that was important strategically, and we had to keep it on the down low, of course, um, and it was submitted yesterday, and then um, we had a press conference this morning to announce it, but it kind of got leaked out, and so, but um, but uh, we're really proud of the effort, but that was just the beginning, uh, the landmarks process in and of itself, um, if it gets if the showbox property gets designated, um, there's this next section. Uh, phase of the project where um, it looks at sort of uh, controls and incentives. Basically, there's an agreement, a negotiation of agreement between the city and the owner. Um, so we're out of it because we're not the owner. Um, and neither is the show box uh, as a business. And so um, essentially, if they can agree to uh, basically accept the designation and to um, comply with the landmarks ordinance, that's, that's ideally what will happen, but we don't think that's what's going to happen. And so will they be able to show that designation, will the owner be able to show that designation deprives them of um, reasonable economic uh, use? And so, um, so then that's a whole different thing, um, phase of the process compared with is the building significant uh, enough to be a landmark? So it's sort of two, two very different sort of parts of the process. Um, it's a long process. There are no guarantees. Um, the thing is, landmark designation itself does not protect use. And we, we know that. Uh, it could protect the structure. Uh, it could protect the exterior and the interior. Um, but the use can change. And um, But it's part of the strategy. It's not the solution. It's part of a solution. And to us, ideally, is that the um, we, we, we believe the owner has every right to sell his property uh, and, and to, to realize that return. And so ideally, if the owner would consider uh, another offer, another buyer, um, at the same um, asking price that, that, that he's getting now, um, selling price. And so, um, so that would make the owner whole. It would ideally uh, keep the show box in its place. Uh, where it belongs, and we truly fundamentally believe that, um, you know, when we talk about the sense of place and what uh, Cynthia was talking about and what Shannon spoke about so eloquently, um, it's about the history of place, about the use, and you tie those two together. It, the show boss has been there since 1939, and you can't really separate the two. If you do, then 
um, you know, what do you have left? It has a really interesting history. It was actually, the building was built as a central public market in 1917, um, across from Pike Place Market. Um, and then in 1939, it was transformed to a ballroom or a dance hall as the show box. And so a lot of the great images that Shannon showed really kind of shows some of that history and um, why it's important to, to preserve these cultural places. Not in amber, it's always sort of changed. And in the future, it, it's just, we just want to continue for future generations. And it's been around for almost 80 years. Thank you. Shama. Shama is a city council member, and I wanted to um, just ask you a bit about, we do have this landmark preservation paperwork in the works, but you also proposed legislation that yesterday was, um, after some amendments, passed unanimously by part of the city council, and there's a vote coming up for it Monday. I was wondering if you could just give everyone a summary of the vote and, and what you think the repercussions are for whether it gets passed or doesn't. Right. Um, and I'm happy to uh, share some details without being too sort of jargony or technocratic about it. But just stepping back for a bit, just to explain how m my office got involved in it. This is, I mean, the, the title of today's event is Sense of Place. Is, is that correct? I, I don't, I mean, for, 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 for us as, as socialists and as people who are fighting for working class people, I mean, our sense of place includes the right to cultural spaces, and I thought Shannon said it really well but when she said that civic pride it should not be confused with nostalgia. That is, that is you know, it's sort of a reductionist point of view. Uh, because uh, as, as she and Ben both alluded to, it is, it, it is uh, who gets to preserve their heritage is very much a class question. It's, it's, it's not, not, not everybody gets equal rights to preserve their heritage, and so, uh, just all, uh, right off the bat, we, you know, we as socialists reject that this is somehow, n you know, sentimental or nostalgic, and that's why it's not legitimate. As, as Cynthia said, you know, Native American people didn't get to preserve their heritage, so it's it's not a it's not a politically neutral question. It's a very politically charged question, actually. And I think the question of uh, whether or not the showbox survives as a music w venue, in our minds, it is not separate. Fundamentally speaking, is not separate from the question of who gets to live in urban spaces? Do we have affordable housing in the first place? And uh, just just a, just a very fundamental question of who gets to occupy urban spaces and what is the soul of the city? And so we we didn't see when when we uh, when our you know we we had hundreds of emails, phone calls, um, other council members and the mayor's office also had it, but nobody responded. We immediately responded because we felt this was fundamentally linked to. Our, uh, the agenda we are fighting on as well. And I, mean, I hope everybody knows that in some ways the, the catalyst for, for, for everybody coming together and getting organized was a local musician and comedian, Jay Middleton, who launched a petition just because he wanted to do something, because he felt so upset by the idea that the showbox wouldn't survive. And by now, nearly 91,000, and maybe by today, 91,000 people have signed that petition. It's really sort of, it took on fire, and, uh, and, and we, the role that my office has been able to play is very much in the context of, you know, just the entire city practically erupting in this idea that th this can't happen, you know, the, the showbox can't go. Um, and so in that context, we started researching what could we, what could we do? And as, as Eugenia mentioned, the landmark, the, one of the first hurdles we ran into is that the landmarking process, I mean, other than, I mean, set, setting aside even the timeline and, and the challenges on that end, as Eugenia mentioned, land, the landmarks uh, preservation laws themselves are not sufficient to save the show box as a music venue. You can preserve the facade. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about preserving the showbox as a music venue. And so there were many community members who said, look, this is right across from the boundary of the Pike Place Market. And even originally, in fact, the original way in which the showbox used to be referred to was show, the showbox at the market. You know, watch whoever, you know, Duke Ellington at, at the showbox at the market. It was very, it, it, even though it was not technically within the boundaries of the Pike Place Market Historical District, it was in spirit part of that whole that whole phenomenon, and we were very 
not only politically inspired by that, but also we saw a technical solution here. If, if we could expand the boundaries of the Pike Place Market historical district to include the show box, then it does make a concrete difference because uh, unlike the landmarks law, the Pike Place Market Historical Commission, the mandate that it has been given uh, in response to the 1971 voter initiative is that they can uh, make decisions not only on the design of the building, but on the use of the building. So this is concretely and technically a viable route. Not, not by any means the end, you know, passing the ordinance is not by any means the end of the process, but it is a viable process. So don't let anyone tell you this can't be done. It can be done. Uh, it's a question of whether we can overcome the political impediments to uh, accomplishing this. And I think rather than focusing on too many nitty gritty of the, uh, of the policy, which I'm happy to answer if people have questions, but I would, I would prefer to talk about the arguments that we have heard against doing this. And uh, one of the things that we, I think we should note is, uh, and, and many other speakers have already alluded to this, is that in nationwide we are facing a massive question of inequality obviously resulting from us, uh, you know, from the system of capitalism, but a real intensification of economic and social and racial inequality. And this is really becoming so, it's manifesting itself in such big ways in metropolitan areas in terms of just an absolutely acute affordable housing crisis, exploding homelessness, and the, and the, and the loss of music venues and cultural spaces is, is also part of that and, and uh, unfortunately often doesn't get talked about. And so it, it, that's one thing that we're seeing to the show box It's actually getting a prominence, this issue that it should get. And, uh, and uh, the, but, but what's even more striking for us in Seattle is that even though this is actually a nationwide and even a global phenomenon of, you know, since the neoliberal era, uh, just uh, working people and pe people without money getting pushed out, even in that c global context, Seattle actually stands out in the sense that the land use laws in this city are far more favorable to de big developers than they are in comparable cities like Boston, San Francisco, DC. So we're not, we're not talking about abstract things as socialists. We're talking about concrete realities, you know, actually talking about the laws that are in place. And as Shannon said, if the laws don't favor the ordinary person, then those laws need to be changed. And that's what we did with civil rights, with abortion rights, which are unfortunately now again on the chopping block, and marriage equality. So we have to do that with land use. It sounds very technocratic, but this is about people's lives. You know, it, it comes down to who gets to occupy urban spaces, and we see the show box as part of that. And you know, Shannon referred to the question of affordable housing. I mean, again, let's be very clear and let's demand a, a real honesty from politicians as well. What ONI, the, the real estate group that uh, you know, wants to build, wants to replace the showbox and build a uh, uh, building uh, there in that place. What ONI, what ONI's project is, is a 44 story, 442 unit, luxury unit building that I'm betting you and I will not be able to afford, even if we wanted to. So this is not, first of all, directly about affordable housing at all. It's a red herring that has been thrown out by a lot of politicians and we should reject it outright. Then there's the whole question of, well, if you allow big developers to build incessantly without control, without ordinary people having a say, then somehow we will eke out a little bit of affordability through the mandatory affordability laws. Well, let me tell you, even on that, Seattle is massively lacking. Comparable cities like Boston and San Francisco, where, where working people have had more successful movements, have pressured their city council successfully into uh, making the MHA type laws, which actually are not the best kind of things for affordable housing, but okay, so we'll, we'll accept affordable housing in any form, you know, we, we want every affordable unit. So we're not opposed to MHA. But the point that we, we should remember is that even with that meager MHA, it is in Seattle through the HALA process that, the, that Mayor Murray initiated with having big developers at the table is so grossly inadequate that if you look at the MHA affordability that Boston and San Francisco are able to extract, Seattle is far, far behind. I mean, last year about eight, you know, nearly 19,000 units were permitted by the city. And out of that, because of the MHA program, we got maybe 19 to 25, depending on whose estimates you listen to, uh, affordable units. I mean, that is nothing given how tens of thousands of people are getting pushed out of the city and working people don't, you know, ordinary people don't get to move in. Obviously, lots of people are moving, moving in, but people with big salaries and wealthy people are moving in. So I think we should, uh, if we want to seriously shave the, save the show box, I keep saying shave, it's uh, 
because I speak so fast. <laughs> we want to save the show box. Then we have to be serious about not accepting this affordable housing argument. There is, um, I know, Shannon, your colleague Ernie, who works at the show box yesterday at City Hall, he said it well. This is not a conflict between culture and affordable housing. This is a conflict between culture and profits. And so the question to City Hall on Monday is, which side are you on? Are you on the side of culture and affordable spaces? Or are you on the side of developer profits? And I'm really hoping, and we, we already had a massive victory. You know, we went from Monday morning city council members saying, this is not right. How can you just try to rush us into things? How, you know, I, I was even told by council member Baksha, we need to consult the community. I said, didn't you hear me? 90,000 people are saying we need to save the show box. Which community uh, would you be possibly talking about? And so we went from the, serious opposition on Monday morning to Monday afternoon when they saw hundreds of people demanding that the show box be saved, suddenly the city council understood that, well, you know, this is not an issue that they can brush aside and they are paying serious attention. So we should, I think it is important that we recognize this is the strength of the movement and the strength of organizing that brought us to this point. So let's bring that strength back to city, uh, to Monday as, as uh, Vivian said, we got a six to zero vote yesterday in the committee, which is phenomenal. So the majority of council members have already voted yes to expand Pike Place market boundaries to incorporate the show box, but, but there will be, but there's already the, as they were voting for it, they also said, well, uh, you know, we have until October 18th because that's a technical deadline that Ani will, you know, as a developer will, will vest. So they, there will be a push to push it back after council, council goes on recess in the last two weeks of August. There will be a push to go, go just wait. I would urge the movement not to, that we should urge the council not to wait because if you're going to pass it, then pass it now because it strengthens the movement to keep building itself rather than keeping it and holding pattern. You know, if you agree, we need to save the show box. And if six council members have already voted yes on it in committee, then what are you waiting for? You know, vote, vote right now. It would be my... Thank you. All right, Evan, I'm going to get to you at the end there. Evan Cliffthorn is a community organizer for Rise Up Belltown, which is a campaign by Humans of Belltown to preserve culture, or sorry, preserve affordable space in Belltown, which includes space for cultural workers and also cultural spaces. So you've been looking at models around the country and where Seattle is lacking and could maybe um, take on some other policies. What have you been exploring? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, so Rise Up Belltown is a campaign to keep our community affordable, and I really appreciate it's Ben, right? Uh, what Ben said a minute ago about uh, how this is nothing new, right? People in Seattle and people who were here before Seattle have been being pushed out since people have been coming across the continent taking money from bound people and using that to pay our soldiers. And I say that because I think it's very relevant to what's happening in Seattle right now. Because I think uh, when we are talking about preserving affordability, uh, we have to be thinking very big picture. right? Because at the end of the day, as Eugenia pointed out, after the building is landmarked, it goes into a controls and incentives phase. And what that really means is if the city can force, the city can only force the developer to keep a landmark if they can show that the developer isn't going to lose any money. And that's really all that means. And at the end of the day, this is what happened in Belltown uh, with uh, what's happening right now with the Wayne Apartments in Belltown, which is where Rocco's Pizza, Lava Lounge, right next to where Shorty's restaurant, or Shorty's uh, Pinball is. And those, uh, that building was designated a landmark. And the city spent two and a half years trying to figure out how the developer could make their money. Eventually realized the developer, they can't force the developer to make the, you know, figure out any way to force the developer to do this. And this was only for a building that was going to be 10 stories, not 44. And uh, so at this point, they have had to say to that owner, well, okay, this is a designated landmark, but go ahead and build your building. You can tear that down when you're ready. And that's the future that we face, not only with the show box, but with all of the affordable spaces in Belltown, with all of the sport, affordable spaces in the CID, uh, all of the sport, affordable spaces in the Central District. Across Seattle, uh, we are dealing with uh, a push that is really just about making money at the end of the day. And, when, uh, and I say that because as we are going up 
right? As buildings get built up, each of those additional stories is square footage that somebody can charge rents to somebody else to pay for, which means that each story has a unit of value that is worth money. So when you look at a place like the Showbox, a developer that's coming in or the owner that's owning that place, uh, that building right now, isn't looking at a two-story building. They're effectively looking at a 44-story building. And the only way to turn all of that development capacity into money is to displace people. Right, which means upzoning fundamentally has always been about displacing people. And it's been about displacing people in order to make money. So when you look at cities around the country, you'll notice that there's always a lot of skyscrapers. And those skyscrapers are always in the center of the building. And there's a reason those center of the city. There's a reason those skyscrapers are in the center of the city. And it's because in each of those cases, the people at the center of the city were the first people there. They're the people who have been owners in that city for longer than anybody else, usually. So over the course of the 20th century, after zoning became a thing, and we realized, oh, and cities won the right to regulate, to some extent, the degree to, what, to which owners could do something with their property, you have seen across the country that the people who have owned that property the longest at the center of the city have gotten the highest rates, have gotten the most up zones. Right, because an upzone is, is nothing really but another opportunity to stack a money-making opportunity on top of a money-making opportunity that you already had to begin with. Right, so each time those, land, those, uh, those up zones go through, what you're seeing is somebody somewhere with money wanted to make sure that that up zone went through. And I'll give you a very poignant example with the show box. Uh, next door to the show box is the Han building. The Han building, well, not right next door, but essentially next door, right? Uh, the Han building is owned by a fifth generation Seattle family uh, who I would bet dollars to donuts that in 1970s when the original proposal was to include uh, the, the land that is now the show box, the, the building where the green tortoise is, all of that was originally proposed to be part of that market district and it was fought politically. As Councilmember Sawan said, this is a political issue. And in the 1970s, they managed to keep it from going into the show box. Well, they've owned that property for you know, 150 years. They're going to own it for what's another 30, right? So here we are, 30 years later and two years ago, uh, they figure, well, maybe it's been long enough. We fought that battle 30 years ago. Now we're, gonna, we're ready to fight that battle again. We're going to push forward with our development. But that money, that, that pile of money, is the same pile of money, right? It's the same ownership. Right? Because when you're talking about big picture land use plans and laws that govern where people, the, the laws that govern where people get to exist, whether it's to create music, to play music, to live, to run a business, when you are uh, writing those laws, at the end of the day, the people with the most power are going to be the ones that see the most benefit. So the people who have been in town the longest are the ones who have the highest up zones, which means they get to make the most money. And that's the system that we need to change. And so that's the system that in Belltown we're trying to change. Uh, by using tools that cities on the East Coast have been using for 50 years. I mean, we really are a frontier town in Seattle in many respects. New York City has been using transferable development rights districts on a district-wide scale to preserve places like the Broadway theaters, Greenwich Village, all over New York. And uh, the basic premise is you say, we're gonna, uh, we, we know that everybody needs to get their money that owns something, so we're gonna let you guys sell you over here on top of Broadway, sell off your development capacity to, somebody who's building a bigger skyscraper down the road, right? And that guy over there, you know, he had a 100-story building, but now he can build a 200-story building. I'm making these numbers up. Uh, but now he can build a 200-story building, but those extra 100 stories, he's got to buy off this guy that has Broadway theater. So it's a very technical concept, what we're talking about. So we put together a video recently called Lego Belltown. Uh, I explained this, uh, these concepts to my nine-year-old nephew, and then he... Uh, is the star of the video explaining back to us using Legos and uh, Star Wars action figures. Um, but in, to sort of wrap up here, the, um, I, we're, we're, our hope is that by, uh, by making this, these kinds of technocratic issues accessible to the public, that we can start to reframe the conversation about how land use laws are written in our city. Because we have to change things at the root level in order to change the way that places can be preserved. If we're talking, we, we need a sense of, you know, I, I want to come back to sort of finish on that sense of space. There's a sense of place. And these spaces that are important to us uh, are still a part of a market, you know, they're still owned by somebody. And we are still living in a market-based economy. So we've got to find solutions that respond. Uh, 
at that fundamental level. Anyway, thank you. Maybe anyone can answer this, but Seattle does have some transferable, uh, sorry, transferable what, right? Development, Development rights. rights. Um, what is the limitations of that right now, and how can we change, like, can we change those, like, to? I'll do the short version, and I know I'm not the best expert on transferable development rights systems uh, in Seattle right now at this table. Who is? Uh, frankly, I would say Eugene. No, I'm like looking at Eugenia. Uh, the short version would be to say that when you are talking about transferable development rights, what you're talking about is a commodity. Something has to be sold and something has to be bought. So what you're buying, or in the case of uh, like a landmark building, which is selling a transfer, selling its development rights, what you're selling is the right for somebody else to build more, right? It's the right for somebody else to turn that development capacity into money. And so in every case where somebody's buying something and somebody's selling something, you have a market uh, and you have the sellers. And so right now in Seattle, uh, we've actually pioneered in some cases the use of transferable development rights back in the 90s for affordable housing, right? So if you're an affordable housing developer, you can, and I'm looking over at Chip here, but if you're an affordable housing developer, you can sell off some of your transferable development rights currently, and that helps bring in some additional dollars for perhaps your rehab of an older brick apartment building in Belltown, as an example. But there is a very limited market for transferable development rights in Seattle, which is limited to a small area in downtown where, uh, they don't necessarily need a lot of transferable development rights, I guess is the shortest way to put it. Right, and I'm looking over, over here, this is, are you nodding? Am I getting this right, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I, first of all, I think there's three people in the world that truly understand how <laughs> TDRs work. It, it, it is crazily complicated. Part of the problem is that the sending sites and receiving sites don't always align in a way that um, the market wants them to. Part of the problem is that where TDR programs are successful, you've got a municipal TDR bank uh, that centrally banks TDRs, uh, buys them low, sells them high, um, and uh, it's a it's a complicated system that does not move fluidly in Seattle. And um, there's the potential to capitalize that bank. Seattle does have an empty TDR bank currently, um, and part of what the planning office is looking at now is capitalizing that TDR bank. I want to just because. Oh, did you want to jump in? Yeah. So. Um, both Evan and Matthew are right. The, the whole transfer development rights or transfer development potential discussion is really complicated. It's convoluted. Um, we struggle with it. The Office of Planning and Community Development, they're actually currently right now doing, okay, I'm gonna get wonky here, an incentive zoning update. <laughs> so TDRs are, um, they're supposed to be an incentive. And so they realized that the current system isn't really working. Um, there were TDRs for historic theaters early on in the 90s, and they were sort of created for very specific things. I think where Ben Royal Hall is, it was very specific. So you have this sort of really um, dis big disconnect of, of, of <laughs> properties that have benefited from this. Um, so, there, so the city's currently looking at how to uh, fix some things. Um, and make it more user friendly, and then consider uh, they're not really expanding um, TDRs. They did recently to the U district because the the big up zone. But um, so we've been trying to work with the city to sort of figure out, just basically say from from a public standpoint, because people ask us, well, oh, well, what what's the benefit of of uh, being a landmark because you could, or being in Pioneer Square or the International District or downtown, you could potentially take advantage of of these TDRs if you're a landmark or in a historic district, because then you could sell your air rights basically um, to someone, to a prop developer that could use the additional height, and then you take that money and put it back into your building for rehabilitation. So a real life example that's actually working is Town Hall. I think we all know Town Hall. Um, there used to be surrounded by big old parking lots. Um, so there are two towers that are going up there. So they sold, uh, so they, they were ascending site. <laughs> Um, for, of, uh, of TDRs, and then um, and so they're they're getting money to um, for their current rehabilitation right now. So that actually works. That's on First Hill. We found out that the Office of Planning and Community Development put in the mandatory housing affordability legislation. They removed First Hill from uh, landmark TDRs. So and we're on First Hill, and we had no idea. 
Uh, we were completely blindsided. So we're trying to get the city to put it back in, but that's a whole other thing. And uh, Shama, you'll be hearing from us about this. <laughs> <laughs> More. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So let's let's let's. If something's complicated, let's make it less complicated, and so that more people can use it and benefit. It's supposed to benefit neighborhoods and communities. And so um, the problem is, like you said, if the zoning is already so high, does someone really need even more floors? I mean, it's, sometimes it's this like uh, we, we, they really don't need it. Well, to that point, it's like Skanska is building a 30-story tower right now. Just not to call them out completely, but they're building a 30-story tower right now on 4th Avenue, right next to where uh, my partner and I live. And what we're hearing from our constituencies in Belltown, for example, is if somebody's building a 30-story tower, the difference between 30 and 50 is de minimis, right? From a, from a cultural standpoint, from a way that you engage. Meanwhile, from Skanska, their building model normally allows them to build up to 50-story buildings, right? So the only reason they're not building another 20 stories is because the city has artificially reduced the heights in the area. Uh, not artificially reduced, but the city has limited the degree to which they can build, uh, build on that particular property. So what we would hope, for example, is that if you took somebody, uh, someone like Skanska or any number of other buildings that are building to their full envelope may well build another 10 to 20 stories. Uh, and it would be, but it's up to us as the city to say, well, we're gonna expand the market area. I just want to take some wisdom from my nine-year-old nephew about the, the white bricks. That, the term that he came up with for development capacity was invisible air money. And I think it was very appropriate because then in the video, each of the invisible air money is like a Lego brick, right? And to your point earlier about uh, how we've used this to date, I think the simplest way to say what the limitation is, is that you've got a lot of people with a lot of, what, lot of invisible air money that they want to sell off and you've got very few people that are interested in buying it. And so to make it a viable system, we need to radically expand the area where people, the, the market for people that want to buy up that development capacity, which means that we need to find those specific areas in the city, I don't know, like two thirds of the city with single family zoning, where we could go up a lot more than we are now and make sure that all of that area where it goes up is coming from areas that, are, that we're trying to preserve for affordability reasons or for any other reason. Cool, I just want Sean to comment real quick and then I want to move on. <laughs> so I don't want to respond to the question of TDS, but it, it's along those lines. And I think, uh, I think it's really important that we as ordinary people who are not the technocrats who are very privy to every detail of land use law, not buy into this idea that only experts can tell us what's right any rational person can tell you what kind of city we need. What kind of city we, do we need? We need an affordable city. We need a livable city. And I also think that we should resist, if we want to really build strong movements to win victories, to build an affordable city, which is what it will require, you know, I hope everybody is familiar enough with politics to understand that most politicians are not organically on your side you you you're going to have to we're going to have to fight for if, if if for the city we need we're going to have to fight for it um, but if we are to build a strong movement and be a strong organized force of working class people of all races and so on we're going to have to not we 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 have to train ourselves not to cede ground of any of to of to any degree to the so called expertise like oh we need something creative, some, some policy we don't know about in order to uh, change Seattle f you know, for the social good. I, I don't think that's true at all, actually, and I, I can't, uh, you know, I, I run into this often. And the funny thing is that there are lots of policies that I know a lot of nitty gritty about, but I, I don't think that's what it's about. It's about, do we, can we build uh, a power in the grassroots to win political victories because that's what it's all about. And, and they will use the, their, nitty-gritty knowledge against us because you, they'll say, well, you don't know how the land use law works. No, bullshit, don't, don't accept that. Um, and so I just wanted to talk about a few policies that I think are very clear that we should be fighting for. I mean, the, uh, Michael talked about 12th Avenue Arts. It, that, see, this is already being done and, it, and Seattle isn't uh, the only city that is doing it. We, we, this is possible. It's possible to build affordable housing and cultural and art spaces together that coexist because typically it's the same community that wants both. They're not at odds with one another, those two goals. But what is the problem? 
The problem is that there's, it's not that anything, there's anything wrong with those projects that have been done. They're actually gems that we have in our uh, community, like 12th Avenue Arts. The problem is that there's not, there's not enough of it. You know, so what we what we what we cannot survive on is having one Twelfth Avenue Arts, one somewhere else, and a little bit somewhere else, and a few hundred affordable housing, uh, permanently affordable units here, and a few hundred affordable units there. That is the problem. The problem is how scarce they are, and how overwhelmingly the market uh, exists on the basis of capitalist forces, meaning you know sell to the highest bidder. So no wonder in a high growth city like Seattle, only people with six figure salaries or more get to afford to live. There's no mystery. I mean, I'm, I'm an economist. I can get into a lot of technocratic details, but there's no mystery about it. That is how it works. So in other words, if we want to address this, we have to, we have to go down to the fundamentals and see what, what does it mean to make a space affordable. Uh, it requires, I would say, what the 12th Avenue Arts model is, if you uh, blow it up on a mass scale, like if we had hundreds of thousands of units in the city that were of that model, then I would call it social housing, meaning on a mass scale, having publicly owned, permanently affordable housing and cultural spaces. That is what we need. But, <laughs> but my point is that that doesn't make me a genius. It, 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 all it means is it points towards what we have to fight for. But to win social housing, look, Friends, we, we, if we actually w are serious about having that kind of policy in Seattle, which means making the whole city accessible and livable for the majority, then you're going to go up against some really powerful forces. It's going to be the big developers, the Wall Street speculators, the property management corporations, the venture capitalists, and all the politicians who serve their interests. So this is a David and Goliath fight, but it's a political fight. It is not a fight for wonky ideas. No, let's, let's, let's build the terrain on the basis of which we can win, not, not accept their terrain of wonkiness where you know, we have lost the battle before we even begin. Because how, how can you expect people who are uh, holding down two or three jobs just to pay their rent, you know, delve into city, whatever, you know, the minutia of policy making? No, let's talk about actual policies. We need social housing. We need rent control. And well, we need um, and we need money. I mean, if, if you want to build social housing on a mass scale, where is how is it going to be funded? We can't fund it on the basis of fundraisers. Yes, we should do fundraisers. We should even urge musicians to you know think of something uh, for the show box. But that not that is not going to be a sustainable and uh, you know a, a long term solution. In the long run, we're going to need deeper solution to that. And there is no ducking the question of taxing big business and taxing the wealthy because that is where the wealth lies. This is the system we live in. That's what capitalism is. You all go to work and the wealth goes to the top. So there's no way of ducking this question, which is why uh, I feel really outraged when politicians in relation to the show box talk about affordable housing because, well, where was your concern about affordable housing when you were repealing the Amazon tax in, uh, you know, in mid-June? Wasn't that about affordable housing? If that tax had stood its ground, then starting next year, we would have built hundreds of units of affordable housing, permanently affordable housing every year. But that didn't go through. And that's why we have to, you know, our movements have to connect the cultural questions of the show box to the larger questions of, uh, you know, actually uh, raising progressive revenues. And that also connects to the King County question right now, which is the executive, King County executive wants to give $185 million to the Mariners billionaire John Stanton how outrageous that that is even a question when the whole county is reeling in, under an affordable housing crisis and not to mention the loss of cultural spaces. So I think we have to connect the dots there and um, you know, really build the movement on our terms. Thank you. So I wanna ask one more question. Yeah. <laughs> I wanna ask one more question to Matthew and then I wanna open it up for Q&A. Don't read too much into this segue, but um, Mayor Durkin kind of announced um, working with Ani Group, um, Showbox, and your office and the Office of Music, um, Film and Music, to search for a solution. Is that something you can comment on right now as to like what direction that's taking or what's been discussed? Um, I, I can agree with that statement that there are conversations taking place. There are a lot of tools at our disposal and a lot of tools that we're looking to develop to help in that conversation. Um, I can also duck the question uh, slightly and pivot to the idea that we've been talking about this as a binary state. Either we grow or we preserve. Um, Pike Pine has been the 
arguably the fastest growing part of Seattle, while Seattle is the fastest growing city in the US. This is arguably the fastest growing neighborhood in the United States. A program that the city developed around facade preservation has attempted to keep the front 10 inches of a building, the facade of the building, while a five over one goes up behind it, while a, a, an apartment, a mixed use apartment building goes up behind it. L let me ask you a question. Would you rather, my favorite game, a corrugated metal and cement building on this site with the Northwest Film Forum thriving behind that facade, or the existing 100-year-old brick facade with a desert tan in here and a Quiznos in front, there is an option to grow as a city and maintain cultural activity and maintain cultural space. I could literally throw a rock to the Hugo house from here, um, which was raised to be replaced by another five over one straight up apartment box full of yuppies the base of which, to use base for the second time tonight, the base of which, the 10,000 foot footprint of which, is gonna be a renewed and invigorated Hugo house that's gonna own that space. It's gonna be theirs forever, they're not paying rent on it. They're gonna own it outright. A person moves to this town every 10 minutes. Since we've been sitting here, it's 8.50, we started at 7.30, uh, seven people have moved here since we started talking up here. Uh, it'll be another half hour before we build a housing unit. We're the 17th largest city, I think, in the US. We th have the third highest number of homeless people living in cars and tents and boxes. Literally one outside of the film forum tonight as we walked in. Every night. <laughs> There's no way for that math to work. Yes, that those white Lego cubes of invisible money. Um, it is a financial decision to fill that potential development box above a piece of property. It's also a way to house the people who move here every 10 minutes. 54,000 people a year moved here last year. It's predicted that that'll sustain for at least two or three more years. Do the math, that's a person every 10 minutes. We can't build on apartments, multifamily housing on 66% of Seattle that's single family housing, that's we sacrosanct. Can. Well, we can, surely, but it's, it's also the third rail of Seattle politics, right? We're, we don't, and, and predictably we're not going to. There's also an enormous industrial section of this town that we're not gonna build mixed use on or, or multifamily on. I've heard the number 20% is what's left over for the creation of multifamily housing. What is the solution? What is the, we can, we can stand in front of the bulldozer every time um, or we can look for what they call an improv comedy. I'm really gonna bring improv comedy into this. What they call an improv comedy, the yes and solution. Yes, and let's see if the bottom two floors of that new building can be the new show box. Bigger, brighter, preserved, exactly the same. Okay. Arguably not. So the, the, but the question is what are the, what are the non-binary alternatives to that? What are the non-binary solutions? And that maybe is the longer answer to your question, is that's what we're looking for. We're looking for non-binary solutions to this, and we're looking for them broadly. The ad hoc way that we've done TDRs that Eugenia was referring to, the ad hoc way that we're extending historic districts or, or uh, appointing this building and that building, I think any solution that we come up with to the show box that isn't equally applicable to the Black and Tan, to, to Africatown, to Equinox, to the Northwest Film Forum, is not a sustainable solution. We need broadly applicable, sustainable solutions throughout town to benefit every community. Not just the GOP, the uh, AEG uh, that owns the show box, um, but broadly, the film forums, the black and tans, the African towns, et cetera. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say a couple words. I don't, I don't know all the technical jargon that they were talking about, that's why I kept pretty, pretty silent. Um, but what I do know is that um, the Black and Tan Hall was built on the premise that we should put people over profit, and that if we put people over profit, then we will be profitable. Because people will feel that they are wanted, they will feel that they are accepted, they will feel that they, they matter. That's our philosophy. We have yet to see if it's gonna work because we haven't opened yet. Um, I, I, I don't accept that we have these two solutions. I'm glad that you 
brought up that we shouldn't live in this binary world. Um, we need to demand that we put people over profit. We have to demand that. And I know that it might sound idealistic, but what's wrong with being idealistic? The French Revolution, when it, start, when it started, was for, was for everybody. Black, white, gypsy included. Um, it didn't include women. Um, <laughs> but it was 1782. <laughs> um, but, um, unacceptable still. Um, but what happened is, is Napoleon took over and gave up all those, all those, that momentum to the plantation owners that wanted to come back to the profits because they needed money, because they had spent all this money on all these wars. We need to think about people and put people that we want that believe in our values in office. You talk about politicians aren't, 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 um, aren't, uh, f uh, organic, organically for us. Then why don't we put people that are organically for us? We don't, need, we don't need a mayor that doesn't believe in what we want. We don't need a city council that doesn't believe in what we want. And so we have to do that. And, you know, there's, you know I, I moved to Seattle, and there's this Seattle freeze thing that we talk about. Well, that's a real, that's a real thing, where we avoid conflict. We, we stick to passive-aggressive, like, whatever, under our breath. Let me, let me send you a text message while I stand next to you. You need to, like, open your eyes, look into the people next to you, and tell them what you'd want and what you demand. That is what we're talking about. All of this mumbo jumbo and this jargon fundamentally comes down to treating each other like people and expecting to be treated like people. If the golden rule has been the golden rule forever, why can't we make it, why can't we cast it in, you know, I don't know, I, whatever the analogy is, like, can we make it gold and keep it gold and like actually use it instead of just talk about it? Can I respond real quick, before, just to the point you made earlier? Because I, I think I want to build on that. And because when you're talking about how we need to grow and we need to pre preserve, and that these often sit in dichotomy to each other in Seattle, I think it's a false dichotomy. And I think it's because we allow ourselves to be limited by these boxes. Uh, to Shama's point earlier, that when the bureaucrats say, well, this is how the land use law works. We're all listening to those bureaucrats who are telling us, well, the land use laws work in such a way that two thirds of the city you don't get to build housing in. But those, those rules were written, and I think Ben started this off, those rules were written based on racism, right? And bigotry. And those rules, you know, it's not to say that all the people living in those parts of the city today share those values by any stretch of the imagination. I think mean, most of them don't. But those rules need to be changed, right? And all of, like, all of our sort of technocratic stuff aside, that is just the base level that we need to be looking at. We need to be re redefining the boxes that we've allowed ourselves to live in. Most of them do, know, do are, are racist and, and do know that they are racist, but they don't want to admit it because they don't want to let go of what they have. And I think we have to come to terms with that. You might not be like, gent like sincerely racist, but you are benefiting from racist history and you need to ac accept it. So yes, you are being racist. And you gotta so we gotta change those laws. So we gotta change those laws. I think someone needs to like draw a flow chart of all the different steps that, of rules that need to be changed or something. Just burn it down. Just burn it down. Yeah. <laughs> the brick will stand. Vivian, I just have something to say. Yeah. I, um, the whole false narrative, false choice thing about preservation or this. Preservation, I've <laughs> been doing advocacy for a long time, and you really have to have thick skin to do this stuff, and we're always being pitted against something else, and it's a false choice. And I'm gonna leave you with one statistic. 0.5% of all the buildings in Seattle are landmarked. That's 0.5%. Nationwide, it's 4.3%. Mm -hmm. So, wow, do, does, if preservation really had that much power, I'd be like, <laughs> so excited right now, but clearly <laughs> that is not the case. It's not showing in the numbers. So why people get so freaked out when we're trying to save the show boss or we're trying to save the Roy View apartments in, on Capitol Hill or name your cultural space, historic building. We own Washington Hall. We saved it in 2009 mm -hmm. and it's in the Central District and we, our whole goal was to, it wasn't to preserve a shell, uh, but it was to preserve a cultural place that means something to the community. And so I just want to sort of uh, end there uh, for now. In the 80s in uh, New York, the Village Voice ran a, a series called The Ten Worst Landlords in New York. They would have their pictures and the details about them. And it became 
a, a political force. Uh, I think that's exactly what's missing from the Seattle fight. The attempt to ID who are the urban growth machine that is kind of working against the rest of us all the time. The rest of us want to go to the showbox, go to parks. The urban growth machine is always looking at the city and thinking, how can I sell off bits of this or monetize it? Who is it? Is it Kate Junkus, Tim Cease, and so forth? We need those names because those are the same people that slap down the Amazon head tax and are going to throw in a huge amount of money against Chama next time to get her out of there. It is a fight between the rest of us and the urban growth machine. We have to take the fight to them and not... It's good that we're waging a combined and an even struggle and all the things that are being done to work through the system are great to save art space, but we need a counterattack to go at them and artists are the people that can do it. So think of ways you can do this. If it's running the stranger every year, the urban growth machine, who's in it? Why are they working against your living in this city? That would be something. But put your heads to it and come up with something more. That reminds me, I did a lot of anti-Islamophobia work and that reminds me there's these websites that basically track like, it was like 10 media moguls that basically donate like millions and millions of dollars to promoting anti-Islamophobia propaganda and this website just lays them all out in these beautiful like flow charts and stuff. So something like that. Someone want to make it? Great. Someone want to make it? Any other questions? After Monday, let's see if we just make this about the show box. After Monday, if that vote goes through, what is it? Could you all give me some very clear answers as to what we need to be doing as members of this community from that point forward? Uh, the, one of the things that was addressed is the fact that there's that 10 month waiting period, right? During which we will, we as a city are going to be tasked with reviewing how to, whether or not to permanently keep it in the, keep the show box within the boundary of the, the within the expanded boundary. Doing so is going to mean, at least to some extent, A, getting the building landmarked, which uh, I have a lot of faith in historic Seattle, and I think it's going to happen, and uh, as long as we all keep showing up to support them. And the, another part of that is the controls and incentives package, and figuring out whether or not we can financially afford to, so if we can win in court if and when the developer Ani sues us. And that means either uh, the uh, conversation with the owner, to Eugenian's point, about uh, musicians or you know singular wealthy people coming in to offer to buy the showbox just as a as a as a gift, as a philanthropic gift, or it means the city having to come up with that the rest of those dollars to become the owner, or it means that we have to find some other type of financial mechanism, whether that's something like transferable development rights or some other tool. But all of those things, I mean, we're not the experts on that, right? But that means that somebody's gonna have to do that work, which means the city council will have to hire a presumably consultants or they'll have to assign their own staff to do that work. And that means that the city council will have to come up with funding to do that. And that's coming up with funding in a time period where you are already pressed around a lot of other issues, whether it be homelessness uh, or other affordable housing projects or everything else. Uh, so, but that that's, what I would say is likely to be the next step is pushing as a community to ensure that they fund our project, fund our uh, fund the evaluation, the consulting process. But I would love to turn it over to you. Right. Um, I, I think we, first I have to be clear, we, there's a lot of uh, uh, intermingling of the landmarking process and the ordinance, which is nothing to do with the landmarking process. It says the Pike Place Historical District boundaries can be extended, which gives the mandate to the existing Pike Place Market, his, Pike Place Historical Commission, which has the uh, authority within the boundaries of the market to uh, make decisions on design and use of the properties within the market. I mean, and, and of, obviously there's a lot more to it. It, uh, you know, Evan is right, there's a question of what, how the owners interact with them, I and they have the, they have rights too. Uh, uh, so they're, they're, it's, not, it's not a clean cut process, but to, to be very clear, the ordinance passing on Monday is very important because what it does, it, it, the city of Seattle, by ordinance, by law, puts that by extending the boundary, by including the show box in the market boundary on an interim basis for 10 months, uh, 
it give, first of all, it gives breathing room because ONI cannot immediately uh, you know, submit its paperwork in a way that uh, legally enables it to override any law on that building. So that's the first, I mean, first things first, right? There's, it's a multi-hurdle process, so let's first ensure that city council stays true to its, I mean, there were a lot of promises yesterday, so you guys got to be there on Monday to hold them to their promises and not let them postpone it, because they will, because that was the last word that the meeting ended on, right? So, so we, we do have to uh, pass that ordinance, because that first, it triggers the 10-month Breathing, breathing process where ONI doesn't get to just seize on it. But it also, because it extends the boundary, it puts the city council, city, uh, city of Seattle puts the authority in the hands of the Pike Place market. So just to give an example, for any, any new construction to happen, this ordinarily the city of Seattle would be the entity that does the design review. There's nothing unusual about it. In this case, the Pike Place Historical Commission does it. But it's somewhat different because the Historical Commission has a mandate by voter initiative that they want to, uh, their mission is to preserve the market's character. You know, it, and again, uh, the moment I said character yesterday, I was attacked by a lot of people saying, oh, you're sounding like NIMBYs. No, let's be honest, this is not about NIMBYism. The Pike Place Market is an accessible place for people of all ages and incomes. That was the whole mandate. And I talked to the, yesterday on the phone, I talked to the chair of the Historical Commission, and she is clearly, and the commission is so passionate, and I think similar to Historic Seattle, they're so passionate about their work, because precisely because it allows a modicum of space for people of all incomes. You know, as, as Eugenia said, we're not in any danger of preserving too much <laughs> of it. You know, so let's let, let's let's again again let's demand honesty from everybody. That, that is a specious argument. That's a false argument. So let's let's reject it. But it gives gives the ability to that, for that to to the ball to get rolling because the historical commission then by law has the right to do to look into that. Now, that doesn't uh, absolve, the passing the ordinance on Monday does not absolve us of other dangers. Like Evan said, Oni will, can sue and probably will try to sue. But here is where the movement comes in. It is not all about the legal and, uh, and wonky details. It, nothing, nothing after the ordinance is passed is etched in stone. Yeah. Oni might want to sue. But it's also a question of how much ill will do they want from the community. If the whole community rises up and says, shame on you for doing this. When the whole city, and actually internationally, if reporters are talking, because I've, I've been contacted by reporters saying, we're interested because we're losing music venues everywhere. And Seattle is like a beacon for us. If you save the show box, that, that, that's going to be a beacon for us. So our job is, is not to second guess the pro exact process because nobody here can honestly tell you exactly what the what the you know step one, step two, step three is going to be, but there are potential scenarios. But it's not, and we we can shape that scenario by making sure that one we cross the first hurdle on Monday, and then not letting our foot off the uh, pedal. Sorry, I always. <laughs> I come from Mumbai where we never drive, drove cars, so I, I mess up the auto metaphors, but I know it's a big part of American culture. But do you know, you know what I mean, you know what I mean. D don't, don't take off the momentum is what, I, what I'm talking about. So we have to maintain the momentum. So I would say concretely what we should do as a movement is first make sure we win on Monday, and then after that we should have an organizing meeting of many of us who are serious about this. You know, Rise Up Belltown should be there, Showbox employees should be there. Uh, black and tan should be there. We should we should get together and decide. Okay, so what are the next steps of organizing? Potentially, it could be a series of summer concerts, but not just concerts just for music, but you know, like a, like a like a protest concert type of thing. You know, we can come up with a different word, but that's the only word I can come up with right now. But, but with a message, you know, uh, I mean, you had Ben Gibbard. You, you today, um, Duff McKagan spoke about you know the, the lots of popular bands, Pearl Jam, Vedder. Vedder uh, wore, wore a Showbox t-shirt last night at the concert. And one of our supporters actually took 600 leaflets for Monday, the leaflets that Adam from my office is handing out. He took 600 leaflets to, the, to where people were waiting to get, in, get into the stadium for, for Pearl Jam. And he said they were grabbing them from his hands because they, these are music lovers and they want to preserve the Showbox. Those are our people. So concretely, I have, a I have an appeal. Who can go? to the Pearl Jam concert tomorrow 
and we will print 1,000, 2,000 leaflets, whatever people are willing to give. So if you can take one hour or two hours of your evening and go there and leaflet to the crowd, I'm telling you, you will find so much love because, uh, you know, Shua, the guy who went there yesterday, he was messaging me as he was there. Oh, one, one lady gave me, gave me $5. They're giving me beer. They're, they're, they're like, thank, thank you for save, well, working to save the show box. Here you go. Get a be take a beer. It's, it's a hot day, you know, that sort of thing. So those are our people. And so these are concrete organizing steps we need to take right now. So who can go on Friday to leaflet at PJ concert? Uh, who can come on Monday, demand? that you, you know, we have a vote right now. Next, let's have an organizing meeting and maybe discuss ideas of or, you know, a summer of concerts around the question of showbox and cultural venues. And what it'll do is it's not just, it's not just like a, just giving art, it's not just about expressing ourselves as an Indian itself. It is about making sure that the powers that be see that we're dead serious about it. And just because if we do win the ordinance on Monday, we're not going to just go off and, you know, scatter off into something else. We have to stay organized as a movement because what happens in the next 10 months matters. So it's not a, it's not a fait accompli in any way. And keep in mind, the ordinance, because of the laws, says interim boundaries. Meaning, if something doesn't concretely happen to actually end up saving the show box, those boundaries are going to expire and it won't be part of the market anymore. So we have to also, the other thing is we have to, we have to let the historical commission uh, members feel like they have a lot of support. I feel like they are on our side because that is their mandate, that is their mission to preserve the market. And they see the show box as part of it. As Evan was saying and others were saying, the original boundaries were intended to be drawn, uh, including to include that block, but lots of uh, you know big landowners and old, old money families prevented that from happening. So the commissioners I know support it, but they will need your support because they will also come under a lot of pressure. So one organizing thing would be for us to, you know, in, to that organizing meeting, to organize a group of people who will go to Pike Place Market itself, get all the people, the farmers, you know, whoever is there, you know, small business owners, get them to be part of the showbox organizing, you know, movement, bring their voice uh, onto the table. Ta we, we need to talk about the employees at the showbox as well and make sure workers' rights are part of the conversation. And then last thing I will say is that we'll never be out of the woods really unless there is an actual concrete proposal for who's going to own the show box and maintain it as a music venue. So I really think that a, a very important point was brought up in this discussion, which is that can we get towards the idea of the city of Seattle owning it you know, as a public space, publicly owned space uh, for, for the city's enjoyment into perpetuity? It can be done. Yes, funds have to be raised, but that's the whole point. You know. <laughs> There are ways to raise those funds. We need to generate the political will for that. I'll tell you one really good thing that will come out of that is not only that will the music venue will be preserved into perpetuity for, pub, for the members of the public for future generations, it will also mean that the employees of the show box will become City of Seattle employees, which means they will get good wages and benefits. <laughs> and so the people who work so hard to bring you the music you so value then will be able to work in dignity. Phil also made an important point that next year, seven council members, and this goes to your question about you know making, if it's, if it's about people over profit, and if the city council and the mayor's office are, are not on board with that, then why don't we fight to get our own voices in city hall? And so that's, that's a larger mandate for our movement, and not just showbox people, but you know, in general, those who are fighting to make Seattle a city that's welcoming for everybody, this is a concrete question. And look, as Phil was saying, whether we like it or not, Next year's elections in, city, in, in the city of Seattle, the theme of the elections will be who gets to call the shots in city hall. Is it Amazon and Jeff Bezos, or is it ordinary people, which includes small businesses and you know, people of all races? So that will be the question regardless, because the Chamber of Commerce and Amazon will frame it that way, <laughs> because they will be throwing their weight on it. So the question for us is, are we prepared to do what we need to do to fight? Just thinking broadly in terms of how to take historic preservation and take community momentum and turn it into community preservation as a, as a thing, as an entity in Seattle, um, from a legal perspective, is one of the options to just create more districts that are special review districts that have the power to bring more people to the table and put the regulatory uh, power in terms of not just what we want the 
neighborhood to look like physically, but what we want it to be like as a place to be, what people we want to be here, what businesses we want to be here. Is, is that the legal path going forward in terms of designation? So I think it's a really great question. I think what fundamentally needs to happen is currently the landmarks ordinance and all the district ordinance. So Pioneer Square has its own ordinance. Pike Place Market has its own ordinance. The International Special Review District has its own ordinance. And they have their own boards. Um, uh, many of these districts are based on architecture, right? <laughs> and so f uh, the inter International Special Review District is different. Um, that was created really as a cultural district. And so um, as, a, as a movement against the kingdom, they didn't want the whole neighborhood to turn in a parking lot for the, for the stadium. Um, so there's a model for that. Um, and the market is also different. I mean, it was about culture as well, uh, cultural heritage. So there are some models, but, but, but there's, there's still a lot of it's based on architecture and design. Mm -hmm. And so um, maybe we call it something else, because I think the, the term historic district really freaks people out. Uh, a National Register District is honorary only. It, the, the power comes from the local ordinances for historic districts. Um, and so, but I think there, we just need to look at these more creatively and how do we figure out how we can create these kinds of districts um, that aren't onerous, <laughs> um, but that still um, achieves the goals that we want. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, a lot of what's been set up here is um, who controls this narrative and who control, who controls the money, basically, who has the money, who, who has the bigger say. Mm -hmm. and, and then they turn around and say, oh, preserving neighborhood character, what does that mean? And, and, and so oftentimes we're just put on the defensive. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it really, um, there's a lot more that needs to, to, um, to happen. Um, bef yeah, I, I would love to see that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I'll be devil's advocate against that for just a, a half a second. I think that districts are an amazing way to elevate and unify community voices, and that that is enormously valuable, um, especially in, in lobbying electeds and, and working within the system. I think that the who, who controls the capital, who drives the story is the question, and I think the projects like the one that Michael presented around the, the Rise Up and um, capitalizing players like Capitol Hill Housing to take part in the market while remaining mission-driven sort of above or outside of that market simultaneously um, is just as important an aspect of preservation as the, the district models are. I mean, just to take your sort of technical question and connect it to the movement type uh, components here, in Belltown, we are right now essentially an unrecognized cultural community district. Right, and that is the case because of a series of apartment buildings that are affordable that are affordable and nearby where you have a lot of artists and because of history, because it has historically been a gathering place at the music venues, at the bars. Uh, it's like, you know, you've basically got a bunch of Cheers bars all in a row, all right next to each other. And so that community is already there. And so when we look at, well, what's the legal tool, we somewhat, to some extent, are stepping back from the, well, whatever technocratic tool we want to use in the end, whether it's a special review district or a special zoning district or it's, uh, or whatever we call it, the, the important part is preserving the space for those people who are in the community to continue to exist in the community. So if it's housing, they need housing, right? If we want music to be happening, we need practice space and we need to be building new practice spaces and we need to preserve ones that are already there. If it's a bar that is a mom and pop type of, uh, operation, then we need to make sure that that, or you know, in case of Belltown, pop and pop or mom and mom uh, mm -hmm. operation, then we've got to make sure that those commercial rents stay affordable. Everything is about preserving space for human beings to exist, and that's the challenge that we're trying to solve. And so whether, regardless of the sort of technical solution, I think the idea is that you have to preserve that space for people. Evan mentioned the Han building, which is at, it's at the main intersection of Pike Place Market, and it's going to be a 14-story hotel. And I'm just wondering, is it too late? Is it too late to revisit that? The short answer, the answer that you're going to get from uh, the city is going to be yes, because the project is vested. Uh, interestingly, um, I, it was, it was uh, one of the other, I can't recall which, but one of the other city council members did share with me that part of the concern 
uh, regarding the as originally drafted proposal for the expanded area of the market was that it would affect the Han building. And, that, and part of that has to do with the sort of the technocratic components that the expansion of the market boundary is different than zoning law. So it goes through a different bubble of weird policy law in a way that uh, means that probably what would have happened is that they the project would have been stopped if the proposal on Monday was passed and with the expanded boundaries, but that would have almost certainly led to a lawsuit because the developer is so far along in their process that they're um, essentially entitled to be able to build that building almost irrespective of the laws. The term that often gets used is vested, and that's what Councilmember Samant was referencing earlier. So the short answer is it's probably too late, and the longer answer is that nothing is too late until a building is gone, as long as there's a big enough movement. With a big enough constituency, anything is possible. Yeah, I, I basically agree with all of that. I mean, from a legal standpoint, um, you know, leaving aside any of the sort of the people power component, yes, it, legally it's gone far enough. One thing I'll share is that there is um, there's another group uh, associated with Pike Place Market called Friends of the Market, who are essentially people who just feel passionate about preserving these urban spaces for people of all incomes, and they they feel that you know it's it's uh, it, that they they understand that uh, even though Pike Place is is historically preserved by law, that it's continually under attack. You know, there's never any there's never any point under capitalism where you can say, okay, we won that now these uh, developers will leave us alone. Of course not, they're not good. They, they, want to, they want to make more profits. They're not gonna leave anything alone. So in that sense, it's an ongoing battle. And they, uh, they, to, they actually did appeal to the city council to not let that go through, but it did, did go through. But Evan is right that zoning laws are separate. At the same time, I also strongly agree that uh, nothing is etched in stone if there's a movement strong enough to fight against it. Uh, and the laws of the land work only to the extent that we accept them. So if, there, if, if Seattle really wants to fight against this sort of thing, then we, sh you know, we, we can do it. But the Han building example is also a very strong reminder for us why we should aggressively fight to get this ordinance passed on Monday, because that is precisely what we are fighting against. And one thing that you will hear on Monday is that the, the city department that is responsible for the, these sort of, uh, uh, you know, paperwork for the for the permits for construction that uh, the developer will not get to that point you know beyond which it we can't challenge them the best thing as they say again it's a technocratic term that that date is October 18th and so there will be a that's why there will be a push to postpone it but the Han building is an example of why we should not postpone it and so that we can definitely have a legal path forward to save the show box. Although, as I said earlier, that will not be the end of it. We will need to keep organizing. I also wanted to just, I, I was going to earlier, but I uh, uh, forgot. I wanted to give a shout out to Misha, who asked that question. Uh, she's been uh, doing this incredible photo project uh, on Save the Show Box. If you all get a chance, you should look at it. It's essentially just people holding up signs on the, describing why they want to save the show box. And I believe it's still ongoing. You're going to do it at KUOW. Oh, KEXP, sorry. No. Yeah. Uh, from 4 to 8 o'clock, we have about 1,000 interested people, and I have about five more photographers. So That's fantastic. Right. Thank, thank you. And you work at the show box, is that right? <laughs> yes. Um, and the other thing I'll add is the Pike Place market, in terms of your question about historical districts and is the solution having more historical districts, uh, I mean, there's lots of solutions, but whether it is uh, a larger citywide uh, approach to make cultural spaces and uh, housing affordable, which I think is the best way to go, or historical districts, they're not, they're not, they, those different avenues are not in conflict with one, one another. Mm -hmm. they, they, we should be fighting for all of those. But they have one thing in common, which is that none of those things can be won just by a legal path and you know, having some really technically sound proposal to take to the city council, no. I mean, Pike Place is a result of a serious community fight back, as Cynthia mentioned at the start of this session, when uh, developers, landowners, you know, big corporations, the mayor, the city council, they were all 
all ready to demolish the Pike Place market and replace it with something called the Pike Place Plaza. I, I wasn't there, I wasn't even born then, but you know, this is, this is something you can glean from just Wikipedia of Pike Place market. The, it, it was a massive, uh, it, it was almost like a touch and go, and, and then community got organized, and it was a serious, the community had to launch a serious fight back, and the result of which was the 1971 voter initiative, which passed with a majority, and then, lo and behold, we have the Pike Place Market. So when politicians of today celebrate the Pike Place Market, but then say that the show box cannot be saved, well, keep in mind that that means that 50 years ago, they would have been the politicians against the Pike Place Market. So uh, you know, it's like saying, oh yeah, I celebrate Martin Luther King and I celebrate civil rights, but then I won't fight against racist policing today. You know, th that's, that's inconsistent. It's just convenient to use something from the past and say, I support that, but today I will be the obstacle to few further progress. Um, other than that, if we could bring it back to the kind of the beginning of the conversation where um, talking about places that don't get seen by mainstream society or aren't recognized as much, um, I just want you all to kind of go around and maybe shout out places that don't have as much visibility as the show box and like the show box having visibility is because it's important, but it's also kind of like a luxury that it has that much visibility. So places that you think need to be recognized that don't. I'm just going to speak to my neighborhood in Columbia City and Hillman City. Um, we've got great venues, uh, the Rainier Cultural Center, um, Columbia City Theater, Royal Room, Rumba Notes. Um, <coughs> Jazz Night School. Jazz Night School. Well, it's not a venue, it's, it's a school, but it is a school that needs to be preserved and it needs to do the thing. Um, and then, of course, Black Town. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Northwest Tap Connection, uh, uh, Duwamish Longhouse, Martyr Sauce, Pipsqueak Gallery. Uh, <laughs> I could go on, I'll rest there. Uh, I'm going to throw out, uh, of course, Second Avenue in Belltown, and we're actively working to, to save these spaces. Uh, Crocodile was mentioned earlier, also not landmarked. Uh, the crocodile has uh, very recently in the last year had the owner up on the roof sawing off the historic facade, pieces of the historic facade, just to try to presumably prep for the future. Uh, but also I want to throw out a Belltown Dance Studio. We are, as an example of a lot of studios that we're uh, sort of artistic spaces that we've lost um, or are losing. We haven't lost them yet, but they're actively looking for space. Uh, so if anybody knows of space, uh, that could even temporarily host a, a ballet or dance studio. Uh, please send that information my way. I just want to give a shout out to the little bungalows of Seattle, which really helped define many neighborhoods here. Um, these are these are historically been affordable places for uh, many generations, and fortunately. Nowadays, you could pay a million dollars for one in Wallingford. I mean, that is just not right. And um, and they just get, or, or you know, you, you buy one, you tear it down, you build a big box on it. And so it's, 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 um, it's, uh, it's happening all over the city, and I deal with it every day. May I just say too, Vivian, there's a gentleman in the back who's been trying to get a question in from the beginning. I think he's just All outside right. your peripheral. I'll let Shama say, and then you're the last one. Sure, just very quickly, I was going to mention, unfortunately, I can't remember the exact name. Of, there's a church um, near 20th and Yesler. The pastor is Reverend Jeffrey. I don't know if somebody can jog my memory. First Method Methodist, or you know the church I'm talking about that burned down in the 1990s? You, you know what I'm talking about, right? That is one of the spaces that fits the description that Vivian was talking about that doesn't get talked about, but it is a community-owned church, and after it was burned down, the community rebuilt it. And, and when I say community, it, I mean um, the fast-disappearing black working-class community of the Central District really worked to preserve it, so it really is indeed a treasure. My name is Terry Morgan. I am Modern Enterprises. We used to be Modern Productions. We started the Showbox Theater as a rock venue back in 1979 and did all the early new wave punk rock shows that basically built the culture that became what uh, Seattle music scene is now. I remember seeing Chris Cornell come into our venue when he was an 18-year-old kid, didn't have a band or anything. Uh, all, all these musicians who are famous now out of Seattle were inspired by the work that we did back then. Uh, the Showbox is a very 
important cultural institution in the city, not just a uh, music venue, but the whole music culture, art culture, um, the tech culture is drawn here because of the music city, the music in the city. Uh, I just want to say I, I applaud the work that you all are doing to save uh, our old friend. Uh, I spent many, many years in the building, and you probably see a lot of our legacy posters and collections and books around the world. But uh, why doesn't the city consider taking eminent domain like the city of Portland did of the, of the Paramount Theater and turning it into a civic uh, theater? Uh, that's what that's what happened down there. They've got a beautiful facility there. Um, you could sell the TDR rights and pay for a whole lot of affordable housing at that point. So uh, that's just my suggestion, and uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I I, I wholeheartedly agree. So yeah. let's let's make make it about that. But, but then let's do the film forum after that. And as Ben mentioned, he wants black and tan eminent domain as well. And there's the Velocity Dance just down the street that is um, at risk, and Annex Theater uh, just around the corner here, which of course is next to um, the the Crybaby Studios. Um, Eighty musicians rehearsing there every day, and then Hugo House, of course, needs some debt relief on on their uh, project. And there's Vermilion Bar as well. Um, how does one create an equitable process to decide who's the recipient of, of that largesse? Um, because it's not unlimited. Yeah. Believe me, the people saying, let's do it all, yes, let's do it all. I mean, of course, let's do it all. Um, let's, let's preserve everything and accept the person moving here every 10 minutes. Um, how, how do we do that? I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't think we should make it a divisive issue like that. It's not a largesse question, it's a question of, that is why I said, I was saying earlier that it's, it's not possible to solve this problem by thinking of it as a, as a benevolence or philanthropy question. This is a city of Seattle question, meaning we, we should be fighting for funds that are raised through progressive revenues, and absolutely we can, we can make this entire city uh, a city that has that, that character of you know, affordable and livable spaces. It's, 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 we shouldn't pit one against the other and say, well, who gets to come to the front of the line? That is exactly, it's a, it's a death knell to winning any one of those because then you, you're, and that's what's happening with uh, equitable development in the city. You know, the city says, well, we have $5 million. Also, all you little guys, you fight over it. So then you have Filipino community, the Ethiopian community, all wanting legitimately, but they're put in a situation where they have to fight together. And one of the things our office has done is trying to bring them all together and you know look at it for, not from us uh, you know fi uh, communities fighting against one another who all have legitimate needs but looking at it as we all have to come together and demand that the city as uh, city politicians act to raise revenues which can be raised and and how could anyone from a mathematical standpoint say there's not enough money in Seattle i mean the city is has never been wealthier. So let's not accept this false argument that there's not enough largesse to go around. It's not a, and largesse is not the right word because it's, it's not a charity question. This is our right. We go to work every day and make this city run. And if the workers didn't go to work a single day, the city would shut down. So, you know, let's tap into that latent power we have because we're the ones who make the city run and absolutely it should run for us. But, not but, actually, yes and, uh, and, <laughs> No buts at all, because I wholeheartedly agree. And I just want to say, and the, the challenge that we're faced with is the challenge that, that Matthew's raising uh, in that right now, the way the laws are set up, the city doesn't have enough money to, to well, not even to buy the show box, right? So we have to generate those revenues, and we have to generate revenue in a new way. And to generate that level, the scale of, of public revenue that we need, we are going to have to change the system. We have to change the laws at a fundamental level, and we have to apply, we're going to have to blow through uh, the, the walls of the sandboxes that have been created uh, since this city was built originally. And I think that that is, uh, that, that type, that challenge is a well-addressed, is a well-raised challenge, because that's our challenge, is to raise that kind of revenue. Thank you all.